Hello again. Let's talk about social inclusion. Taiwan's indigenous peoples have uh, a long history of living uh, as autonomous nations. However, as Taiwan democratized, the state began to recognize, um, let's say, individual indigenous rights, but not indigenous sovereignty. And this is what we're addressing uh, today in this episode. We have invited uh, our two speakers, Scott Simon from the University of Ottawa and Aoi Mona from the National Tonghua University in Taiwan. Our speakers will, well, we're uh, discussing with, with them two court rulings that illustrate how liberal indigeneity undermines indigenous sovereignty. We'll jump into that in a bit. Scott and Simon, uh, Scott and Howie, sorry, welcome. No, thank you. It's Hi. nice to be here. Nice to be Howie. here. Howie, I would perhaps start with you uh, by asking the most obvious, pretty, probably a little bit obvious, why is this topic important to conduct research on? Okay, thank you for the questions. I think uh, the reason we pick up this uh, topic uh, is that uh, in a very simple way, uh, Taiwan or the Republic of China has always been like uh, identified by the whole world is more like a, a majority of Han's uh, state. Uh, but in Taiwan, uh, if we take the perspective for, of indigenous peoples, we have been uh, living on this island for thousands of years. So uh, some of the academic research and uh, has also pointed out that Taiwan is a land as a settler state. Uh, so there are a number of different issues that need to be clarified, not only within Taiwan, but also to expose uh, to the international communities. So I think that's one of the critical reasons why we pick up uh, this topic as our uh, research paper. To identify indigenous people is not part of the majority of Hans and not uh, part of the, the, the idea of the state of Taiwan of Republic of China. We are um, uh, inherently as a self-determination, a self-determining uh, political entity. And then that need to be uh, clarified uh, on this level. But I think that's for, uh, for uh, from what I thought uh, about this topic. Maybe mm -hmm. Scott can add some more. Mm -hmm. Scott, let's wrap this up a little bit more. Um, what was the research gap specifically that you wanted to address in this uh, study? Yeah, so I think what it, what it was is that in the year 2020, um, the pandemic was just beginning and we were, I was in Taiwan and Awi and I were at a meeting of the SEDEC National Council, but we found out that there was a, a, a demonstration in Taipei for Black Lives Matter. And it included uh, the indigenous uh, youth movement there. And they made some very interesting speeches about the problems they have in making parallels with Black Lives Matter. And so that inspired the two of us to think through uh, critical race theory and to see if there was something we could learn from critical race theory that's relevant to Taiwan. And also if looking at the indigenous Taiwan um, legal issues, if we can make a contribution as well to, to that literature of, of critical race theory. So that was kind of the gap we were looking for is trying to bring together, like at that demonstration in Taipei, um, critical race theory and indigenous Taiwan. And the result, I think, was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's jump into those findings. Okay, so I think that the, the main findings of the study was we uh, we took a look at, at two court rulings. And one of the main issues of critical race theory is that uh, there are often laws and court decisions that protect the rights of individuals, uh, but they don't change the system mm -hmm. and they don't change some of the systemic forms of racism that exist. And that's kind of what we found here with these two court cases that we looked at. 
Um, the first is one that I that we have both looked at intensely for a long time, and it was a course about it was a, a case about an indigenous hunter um, who had been arrested, um, found guilty, um, and and charged with illegally possessing a hunting rifle that was not because the, the rule is in Taiwan, indigenous people can hunt, but they have to make their own rifles. And so he had a, a rifle that was just a little bit too advanced. Um, and he also had failed to register with the authorities according to law, uh, which says that they have to register where and when they're going to hunt, what they're going to catch. And hunters know that's impossible. Animals don't make uh, appointments with them. Um, and so the, basically the, the court ruled that the laws are are... Another thing, it was also charged with taking endangered species. And so the court basically ruled that the laws that limit hunting are reasonable, um, that they can limit the species, so they're not permitted to hunt endangered species or any kind of um, limited species. And they have to follow the rules about registration, um, but the rules about the guns, they have to be made clear. So it's not changing the law at all. It's just asking them to make them a bit clearer and easier to follow. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question of proportionality. Okay. And then the second one was about, about whether or not um, children born of a Han or a non-Indigenous and an Indigenous parent um, would be able to have Indigenous status if they use the non-Indigenous name. Uh, the law until then had said you have to use the Indigenous name to get status. And they decided that's an individual choice, whether you use your, your Han Chinese name, which I think the fathers would like them to do if the father is Chinese um, or not. And so the court decided it's an individual decision. Now, both of these uh, impinge upon indigenous sovereignty. The idea I think is that hunters should be able to regulate their own hunting grounds and um, that there really should be ways in which the indigenous communities, rather than the state, decide their own membership roles. And so both of these court rulings, although they uphold uh, the rights of, ind of individuals, um, and though they claim to be anti-discriminatory, they actually fail to recognize indigenous sovereignty. And so that was the main finding. Mm -hmm. Let's follow up on this, um, Howie. So I think the two, uh, imp two important ideas that Scott passed was uh, how the system is not able to uh, fight systemic um, forms of racism and his affection on indigenous sovereignty. I'm curious to know more about policy impacts, potential policy impacts of what you found, Howie. I think, uh, thanks for that. Uh, follow on Scott's uh, point, I think I was I would divide into two different aspects from the individual aspect. I think it, it is a way from our finding that uh, indigenous individual uh, can have more discussion and talk uh, to the general public. How does this uh, naming, I mean, when how, how does this naming on indigenous people can be racial and we can adjust the this type of uh, inferiority imposed on indigenous peoples. And on a collective aspect uh, for, for the public policy, I think it is very important and we can see this uh, changing, especially uh, from the 2016, the national apology delivered by our president Chai Ing-wen. Uh, so that has a, a shift. I mean, it, it's a shift from the uh, government part, which bring back to the general society, what we have been advancing in Taiwan, we call it uh, indigenous mainstreaming which means the, the, the policy has to take into account the collective part of the indigenous sovereignty uh, to do the evaluation on the old indigenous policy. I think that's one of the uh, uh, collective aspect on how the, our research finding has already been pushed forward. And another example is that Taiwan has launched a series of national reports on the International Human Rights uh, Convention, how does our government has been implemented in Taiwan? And right now we are currently doing the ICERT, the, the so-called International Convention on uh, all forms of racial discrimination. So in the past, uh, we always take uh, 
uh, we always see this uh, convention from the individual basis. But right now we have to take into account the collective part of indigenous claims uh, when we evaluate how does the government uh, policy has impact on indigenous peoples. So I think that that's a, a number of different examples we have been seeing right now in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And how are we both on the individual or either on the individual or collective uh, changes for the future? Let's look at the research now again. So what can we look for in terms of research for the future? What's left to to find? Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, Scott. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> uh, you, uh, I'll have to you. Okay. So I think there's a lot of work that we can both do. And we've been working together as a an anthropologist, as ethnography, and then as a legal scholar. But I think that uh, for ethnographical research, I think that there's quite a bit to do. There are um, 16 officially recognized indigenous nations. They're recognized as peoples. Um, they don't always have the same aspirations to, to nationhood. or And so I think that it would be good to do research, and this is going to take a lot of people, on the different groups and what are their dreams and aspirations for sovereignty. And how does that fit in with their traditional and customary law, which all of them have, the SEDEC, uh, um, Awi, and those is from the SEDEC, has a, a law called Gaia. And so really to understand these uh, customary laws and how that relates to sovereignty, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. And to do the diversity of it across the island. So Awi. Yeah, uh, I think uh, for the future development, it is um, an, it should be a motivation for the Taiwan academic or even the public officials because uh, indigenous people in Taiwan for a long, long time has been recognized as a part of the majority Hans. So I think the, the, the future development, especially on the research, we will, we will be taking a very critical and important aspect uh, on, the, on, on this uh, critical racial theory uh, to explore more on how does the public policy should be uh, reviewed and uh, evaluated and uh, maybe do more future research. And that should be an interdisciplinary uh, field on the, all the different uh, uh, a, a, a academic area that we, we, we can all collaborate together. I think that that's a uh, uh, forward we, we can see. Mm -hmm. So you, you did work on the tip of the iceberg, of a big iceberg still to, to explore there. Scott, uh, some further materials that you'd like to share uh, with our listeners? Yeah, sure. First of all, I would suggest that you know listeners take a look at the article because the bibliography is is quite good. Awi Mona's essay that's in there is, I think, a very important touchstone article. Um, and I think that the idea that the doctrine of discovery uh, applies also to to Taiwan is something that's important there. Mm -hmm. um, if I can do some self promotion, I also in this in this year have published a book with the University of Toronto Press. It's called Truly Human Indigeneity and Indigenous Resurgence on Formosa. Um, it's based on, on, on years and years of research with uh, with uh, actually in the community where Aoi's father and the community where his mother comes from and some others, and really looking at issues of Gaia and traditional law and what that means uh, moving forward, not just for uh, the SEDEC, um, and, and Taiwan, but also for, for humans, because we're living in a difficult time with uh, climate change and threats of war on the horizon and so forth. So I think those traditional laws and ideas of morality are quite important. Mm -hmm. Scott, this has been um, quite a straight on point episode. Uh, I'm sure our listeners will agree on that. But I will ask you to close this episode with a punchline in one, two sentences to wrap up this whole conversation. What would it be? Yeah, for me, it would be to remember that indigenous Peoples exist in many parts of the world, not just in the paradigmatic cases of the US, Canada, and Australia, New Zealand, but Taiwan also has indigenous peoples who were there thousands of years before any state ever controlled this island, long before any Chinese or Japanese or any outsiders like the Dutch and the Spanish were there. So I think that's the important takeaway. Mm -hmm. There are indigenous peoples on the island and they're there to stay. Perfect. Straight to the point. Scott, Howie, thank you very much for this episode. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. To our listeners, if you are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources that Scott mentioned and the article by Scott and Howie um, in Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website. Everything is there for you to access, free, um, totally open access. You can also, uh, also listen to this episode 
wherever you get your podcast, you can subscribe to our newsletter and you can follow us on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.